Hello, Eric. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Fine. Very Good. happy, very happy to see you here. Yeah, it's nice warm in Natal. Yeah. I love the beaches. <laughs> for sure, but the beaches is closed now for the pandemic, so it's it's a uh, hard times. Huh? Yeah. So, Eric, I will introduce uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the section seven, Effects of Climate Change on Shallow Lakes. I would like to remind you that the microphones and cameras should remain off, except of the session coordinators and the presence where, when uh, it's device. And please be aware the session will be, will be recorded, okay? The session will be coordinated by Dr. Eric Jefferson and Dr. Thomas Davidson. And Dr. Uh, Eric Jefferson will forward the questions sent by the participants to respective authors, and the authors will be invited to make their considerations. So we invite you to write your question and comments in the chat area. So would like to invite the session coordinator. Dr. Eric Jepsen, you can start the work. Yeah, uh, in order not to get a too diffuse discussion, I decided that I will give a short introduction where I go through the, the, 10, pa the, the 10 papers we have today very shortly, and then we can maybe have a more coherent discussion on the, the topics but you, of course, also very welcome just to ask uh, specific questions. But I think it'll be too uh, difficult to, to run this with just with questions and answers. And especially because many of the questions that have been raised before the meeting has already been answered. So therefore, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it'll be too diffuse. So I will go through and take a 10, 15 minutes. And then we discuss from this, I think. This is the way forward, at least the one I've selected. So uh, I have to find, uh, share the right, where is it? And now I cannot find it. Uh, kindly to ask to the other people, please take the microphones off in this moment. I have problems. Okay. Not fine, Eric. I try to close it. Also. You cannot see this, I guess. Share presentation, no? No, I cannot get the right here. Too. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. From beginning, you can see this? Yes. Yes, we have uh, 10 talks today. And I just took it from uh, the order from uh, the Excel file we got. So this is not the order I'm following. Uh, but we start here with uh, the presentation from Estonia. And it's Tina. And she's now a four-star four scientist because she got a big medal here one of the last few days uh, from Estonia. So she's, she's a four-star scientist now. And this group is a very big group and they will arrange the next Shallow Lakes conference. So uh, you have to listen a little bit to what they are saying. And uh, they are, uh, Tina is presenting a lot of the activities they have in, uh, on Shallow Lakes in Estonia. 
and it's uh, mainly concentrated on like food webs and uh, carbon metabolisms across gradient of catchment and salinity and climate. I'll not go through all these uh, details because the video contain a lot of different information. I have selected some that also fits a little bit into some of the other topics that uh, we are discussing here today. One thing that they have been looking at is uh, what is uh, the effect of lake size. And they have been uh, uh, looking at lakes of different sizes in, in Estonia and try to see how sensitive they are to climate change. And this is uh, from the sediment record. So it's from back in time, uh, the last uh, 10,000 years. And uh, the, one of the conclusions from this paper and the study that they had was that uh, the large lakes are much less sensitive than small lakes. This is something we could discuss later today, but uh, that uh, the small lakes are where we should look for uh, signals of climate change, first of all. That's uh, one of the conclusions here. Another one is that uh, uh, lake productivity uh, and, and eutrophication will affect the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, especially will they be high in the more eutrophic systems. Uh, and this is also what we are discussing mainly tomorrow, but we can also take it up today. The, the third one I took uh, out from the presentation is that the global warming and eutrophication increase for antibacterial biomass, including the toxic bloom forming species in shallow eutrophic lakes. This has also been seen in several other studies. And I will also present uh, from other um, papers at this meeting, the similar studies, and then we can try to discuss it a little bit more in detail. Because this is based here on uh, studies of lake, uh, long time studies, so we have time series. But others have been looking in, at this conference, have been looking at presentation uh, on, on the effect of uh, warming on cyanobacteria by experiments. And here is the experiment by Giovanni, uh, together with Mariana Mehoff working in, in the Uruguay. And uh, they have been uh, looking at uh, systems where they have a, a different, uh, they had a natural phytoplankton community, and then they gave them a different uh, temperature conditions under unlimited nutrient conditions. This means that there were no nutrient that were limiting. It was only, you can say, the temperature in this case. And they had 10 replicates of each. And this is very nice for this study that you have so many replicates because it uh, reduced the error bars a lot uh, and therefore the chances to uh, show effects are much bigger. And then they've been looking at it at a different time period. And here you can see some of the results of the total biomass. And, uh, they have 17 degrees, 20 degrees and 23 degrees. And you can see that they have an increase in, uh, in total biomass and especially at the end, the highest temperature ended up with the highest biomass. And uh, then you have intermediate uh, uh, biomass at intermediate temperatures and so on. Of course, this is an experiment uh, that have been running for a very short time, you can say. They, you start up with an inoculum and then you add a lot of nutrients. So they have a new start, you can say. So you are starting up an experiment where they give them a different temperature under unlimited conditions. So we can always discuss later on if this is uh, uh, giving the full answer or is it only giving part of the answer but it, uh, of what climate change will affect the system because this is a special system you have developed up here, set up here. If they look at, uh, they look at the green algae and the cyanobacteria and they saw that in intermediate temperature, then it was green algae that became dominating. And uh, in, uh, at the highest temperature, it was cyanobacteria. So is it so that a higher uh, intermediate temperature increase will lead to green algae dominance and high temperature will be used to cyanobacteria dominance under unlimited Newton conditions. This is something for discussion also. They also looked at another thing is that uh, this resource use, this means that how much chlorophyll do you get out of each uh, Newton level? Uh, in this case here, I think it was phosphorus they used. And uh, here you can see that the higher the temperature, the higher is the yield. You get more algae out of a, a given Newton level. They also looked to the right about uh, the CO2 influx. Uh, they looked at influx and outflux, but it was mainly an influx in this system. But the influx of carbon dioxide was less at the, the highest temperature, indicating that you can say that it will lead to relatively more global warming than if it was at low temperature. In this case, it's at, uh, attracting uh, neutrons, but in other systems, it'll be releasing neutrons. So, but, uh, 
A similar experiment was done uh, by Noor Felis, not exactly the same kind of experiments, but also looking at the uh, effect of warming and uh, neutron. Uh, in, in, and they were looking at a one-year uh, period in the mesocosmos. And uh, here you see them in a little bit bigger scale than the one you saw before, and it has also sediment and fish and other things included. And uh, there were two uh, levels. There were ambient temperature and then plus four degrees. And then there were high neutron. They were already eutrophic, the, the low neutron ones. And then the hypertrophic, where they added at least minute more extra neutron to the system. So hypertrophic and eutrophic, low temperature, ambient, and higher temperature. And uh, if they look at the uh, different components, and then you can see to the left uh, the effect of the, you can see that the four different seasons. And if you look to the left, you can see the effect of different components. And, and generally, they found that the neutron had an effect on, on uh, the chlor, uh, chlorophytes, and the warming had an effect on it. This is a little bit the same as before. The chlorophytes get a better chance when it's get a little bit warmer. They also saw that cyanobacteria was affected by warming, but not really by the neutrons in these systems here. And they looked at other things like size diversity and could conclude that they were mainly affected by neutrons. So in this way, you have a longer time experiment and you have different seasons and can try to see if you have similar response in different seasons. And I'm not going to detail with that. Noor can talk a little bit more about that. And if we then take the next experiment, is Madhu. Uh, she did an experiment in uh, the tanks in Silkeborg in Denmark. And uh, there you have uh, tr three different temperatures. You can see them up to the left uh, during the uh, summer season. And then you have uh, two neutron levels, very high and uh, very low. And the interesting thing in this experiment was that uh, for one year, uh, the high neutron loaded system only got phosphorus. They didn't get a nitrogen, extra nitrogen. They get a little in with, with the groundwater, but uh, not uh, the additional neutron that were added for many, many years. And then after one year, it came back again, the nitrogen loading. And uh, she was then looking at, uh, using the, the pigment analysis and uh, HPLC uh, to analyze the different components in the di uh, different phytoplankton communities in the different system. And first of all, you can see here the, to the left, you have the, the one with low neutron uh, uh, level and there were no change in nitrogen. And these are the data from uh, three different temperatures. The basic one, ambient A2 scenario and then A2 plus 50%. So this is the tem temperature change. And to the right, you have the high neutron tanks. And uh, the low uh, N addition was, uh, for one year, it has been low. And just a, a few uh, weeks before, uh, they came back again, the nitrogen. Then, uh, then they looked at uh, the comp composition and uh, amount of algae during this period. You can see chlorophyll at the upper one, and cyanobacteria at the lower one. And then N was added back, where you see the arrow. And then you see, for, especially for the A2 scenario, you have a dramatical effect of the addition of N uh, to the system, uh, but not for the highest uh, tanks, in the in highest temperature tanks. They are, uh, are much more clear than the intermediate ones. And this is uh, consistent during the experimental period since 2003, that uh, we get filamentous algae instead of, of uh, the, the phytoplankton in the system and therefore they become more clear. And you can see cyanobacteria especially are affected by this uh, addition of nitrogen. And uh, uh, what the conclusion was, uh, there are other conclusions, but for phytoplankton dominated community, both temperature and neutron treatment were important predictors. And the influence of N was most pronounced for cyanobacteria and especially a phanisomenon. And uh, this is uh, one of the questions was raised, why, why a phanisomenon? It was uh, it's in Jan Köhler that asked this and this, will probably be answered during this meeting here. Uh, going from this scale, from small to uh, mesocosms and then to the field and the field data from Danish lakes for 30 years of monitoring data. And uh, we have been looking at uh, the effect uh, of uh, on, on 600 lakes uh, in a 30, 30 years monitoring period, not for all of the lakes, but for some other lakes. And what we have been doing here is a simple regression analysis where we have tried to look at uh, the effect of a response variable, in this case, cyanobacteria volume, and uh, then uh, compare that with, uh, you can say, in a regression with total phosphorus, total nitrogen, 
uh, depth and uh, and temperature. And if there's positive here, it means that you have a positive effect of a given variable. In this case here, for instance, you have a positive effect of phosphorus, that's the blue one. You have a positive effect of nitrogen when we come to July and uh, to October. And uh, while the depth is a positive in uh, so summertime, uh, but uh, then, then you can see that uh, in, in this case here, the temperature effect is enormous because the slope on this regression with temperature goes very high up, especially in August. And this is the percentage of the total volume we have here. And, uh, and looking then at the effect of this, uh, uh, we try to make a 3 to 4D plot here. The 3D plot, you have total phosphorus, you have temperature, and then you have percentage of antibacteria. And you can see with the increasing temperature and increasing total phosphorus, you get a dramatic increase in so antibacteria percentage. If you take the left one at two milligram nitrogen per liter, and especially if uh, you, the combined effect of temperature and phosphorus is high. And you also see that if you then go to, to the right, go to 2N down to one milligram or 0.5 milligram, you get a dramatic reduction in so antibacteria. And uh, so, so the nitrogen play a big role here. And this is also something we can discuss a little bit more. And it fits quite well to the Salca and Ecoframe lakes that uh, were co collected by uh, Siren Koston some years ago. And uh, along a very large gradient, you can see to the left, uh, the data from South America and Europe. And uh, the conclusion was a little bit similar. This means that uh, the regional response we have seen is similar to that in the cross-latitude cross observation, not very different from that. The next experiment is, uh, now we go to more details here, back to experiments, and then it's on uh, the heat wave effect. And this is a study in uh, Lake Balaton area uh, that has been run there for eight weeks. And, uh, and you can see the tanks that have been used there, they are on land and, and, and run, uh, this way. And then they have a three different uh, situations. They have a situation where they uh, have a constant uh, climate warming and uh, then they have heat waves. So a little bit extra warming during this period. And you can see the temperatures over here, the difference. So they heated it up. Oh, I have to go back. What happened here? They heated it up and uh, and then they stopped the, the heat wave. But uh, the constant uh, the, uh, CV is a more constant temperature, as you can see up in the corner here, that it's more constant higher than the ambient one. So they go very fast up and down again and so on. And then they stopped after some time, both the constant one and the other one. And what they saw is here in this guy, case of chlorophyll, you can see that the, the, it, during the heat wave, there are not really big difference between the three scenarios. But after the first heat wave, there was a very big increase in the chlorophyll in the, in the, in the heat wave tanks, those that had heat waves from time to time, and then it fall back again. And after that, it's uh, less clear what's happening in the system. But you had during the heat wave at least a much increase in uh, after the heat wave, a much increase in chlorophyll compared to the other ones. You can also see another thing that uh, we have to discuss also. I think when we look at climate change effect. It's the seasonality effect, because you can see here in, in, in this M NMDS plot is that we have situations here from the first day and then you move in the direction here. So you change the system over time. You have a treatment effect, but you have also a seasonality effect uh, in, included in these ones. And this is really worth discussing also. Are we looking at climate change effect or are we looking at a combination of seasonality and climate change effect? And how far can we go in the conclusion? I'm not criticizing. It's just the different approaches in different systems. And uh, they concluded that uh, there's a big effect of uh, temperature and uh, heat waves on, on the systems. Uh, and I'm not going to detail. They also looked a lot on zooplankton, but uh, they can come back to that themselves later. Then I didn't have a presentation for, for this one here from Laguna Sauce, but I took it from the, instead from the abstract, and this is a group of people that have been looking at Sylvanus uh, Romopsis in, in uh, uh, Laguna Sauce. And this is a si system that uh, uh, suffer from uh, blooms of nitrogen fiction, blue green algae from time to time. And they were looking at the time series from 2015 to 20. And uh, they have two periods where they have a very high uh, uh, peak of Sylvanus Romopsis. In, in, and uh, then they try to look at the effect, uh, what created that. 
and they found that uh, that uh, the blooms uh, occurred when uh, you had a high water transparency, uh, high radiance to the bottom, you have a long residence time, and it was low rainfall and low water level. And vice versa, the bloom disappeared when it got wet and more cold. So this was the, one of the conclusions from this. And then they could also use this information because uh, if you are going to use it as a drinking water resource that Laguna Sousa is then uh, used for, then you, you can maybe come up with predictions for when you, uh, early warning for when it will happen based on this information. Then there are other studies also on uh, neutron and, and warming. And one is here from Carolina, Tokin, and she is working in uh, the same system as we saw before from Mario, where you have a running in, in the Danish system where you had a period of one year without nitrogen addition, or only a little nitrogen addition, and then you went back again. And then, then uh, Carolina run some uh, experiments with pure phyton on, uh, in, in small uh, tanks here, you can say, with, uh, where they had agar, different input of uh, neutrons. So some had only nitrogen, some had phosphorus, some had both phosphorus and nitrogen. And then she looked at the effect uh, in these tanks before and after the addition of extra neutron. There's a lot of data, but I'll just take one thing out because it's all something we can discuss also a little bit. And that is uh, the quality. And she has been looking at uh, EPA and DHA uh, in uh, these systems to look at the quality. So there's a lipid uh, uh, content in these systems. Really. And, and you can see if you look at the, these data here is if there are only nitrogen input from the, from the tanks, little tank. And uh, here is with nitrogen and phosphorus input and there's phosphorus input and, and, and uh, both of them. And what you can see here is that uh, when we had a period before and after nitrogen addition, this is before in the bottom here and after here, then you can see that it's worse uh, after. When you get nitrogen come back to the system again, then uh, the quality goes down of the pure phyton on these ones. And you can also see the temperature effect is uh, relatively clear. And com combined effect is uh, also strong here, that uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. But it's really a nitrogen story more than it is a phosphorus story here. So we, you can see quality change. So we, with warming combined with neutrons, there might be quality change uh, that lead to, uh, that is uh, less attractive for the organisms to feed on these guys. And this is uh, something we can discuss that is not only a question of quantity, but also a question of quality. And uh, you can see her conclusions here put together here. If you, oh, I'm not good at this. That uh, if you can see to the left, eutrophication, then you can see that uh, at ambient, where there are no response, but then she get more and more nitrogen effect, uh, negative nitrogen effect uh, with increase in temperature at low neutron level. At high neutron level, there's always a negative effect of the nitrogen addition. Then we have another experiment here where you also uh, uh, get a different uh, quality of the sources. This is a DOC quality uh, study by Dilvin and others in the Turkey tanks. And they had these control system, then they have a, a bad quality DOC. This was human feet. And then they had a labile one, which are made of, uh, of leaves that uh, also gets some extra nutrient, not only DOC and easily degradable ones. And then they had one uh, set where they combined the two. So they had uh, four different treatments here. And uh, again, I'll not go into details. He looked at a lot of things, uh, effect on the zooplankton. But one of the things you can see here is uh, how it affected the functional richness. So when you had the control, it's relatively low. When you had uh, the labile uh, DUC, it went up dramatically. And also when it's combined with the uh, recalcient ones, uh, so the uh, humid feed was added together with it. And then you can see that the only if it's uh, the low quality DUC, then it's low also like the uh, controlled ones. And you can see that for many different things like uh, species richness also and functional evenness while it's a little bit different for species even. But there are some strong effect of this also that the quality of the DOC affect uh, the function of the system and also uh, in the, the other components that uh, you can see to the left as she was looking at. 
And uh, one of the conclusions here is that the uh, particle like uh, DUC type, uh, particular DUC type, have different responses, uh, lead to different responses in zooplankton, especially Daphne like that you get uh, this high P content labile DUC, while uh, other uh, organisms like copperboards can better tolerate uh, the serration with low P. The final one here is uh, on salinity. It should maybe have been in uh, that another session that runs tomorrow, but uh, it's still again a multi, you can say, factor effect that we are dealing with here. And we take it in anyway, because it's in this session. And it's a salinity driven factor for phytoplankton community in brackish shallow Mediterranean lake. And uh, Igor was studying uh, a system here for, for many years where there's sometimes a little bit more saline than other times and learned, looked at the phytoplankton composition. And you can see the phytoplankton composition at the bottom there over the different seasons for this long time period. And uh, I'll not go into detail again because there are many detailed data. But uh, one of the conclusion is that you get a very clear species, uh, species shift when you get a change in salinity uh, in uh, these systems. And when it's a higher salinity, there were also more clear water and it was benthic dominated system, while in the freshwater situation, it was a little bit different in Cosmarium and Sinodopsis was the dominating one. And now I put all these things together and this is a starting point for our discussion. I just up, put up some potential discussion topics, but it can be others and also all your questions. You're allowed to ask anyone about anything in this one and a half hour. But one of the things we could discuss a little bit, warming effect in short term experiments versus long term response. Are they similar? Are they different? What are the co pros and cons? And what are the consequences from greenhouse gases? Do we expect the same from short-term experiments as we get from long-term experiments? Are green algae stimulated at intermediate temperature increase and cyanobacteria at high increase? This was one of the conclusions from the Uruguayan Brazilian experiment. And then warming effects on the food quantity versus food quality. Do we generally see that food quality goes down when we get a warming increase at the high nutrient levels? Lake size, is that of importance for climate change effect? That's one of the questions from, uh, from Tina and August uh, studies. And then we have the heat wave, short term and long term effects. Do we expect that these heat waves that we see were an immediate eff effect? What are the consequences on the longer term? Are there really any? Or if yes, what kind of changes can we expect? And then we can discuss a little bit the multi-stressor effect as we have seen in some of the experiment and answer specific questions that you may have. That's my contribution now. Done. Now I have to unshare. Thank you, Eric. That was great. See everything. I'm out now, I am not. Yeah. Yeah. Stop here. Good. You're all welcome. Also, those that are presenting today, the 10 people, they are allowed to say something now first, maybe, uh, about the results. And uh, well, not long. We don't have a long. You have presented by your video. So it's only uh, additional things to what I said, what you'll add extra. And then we take a discussion uh, from that. Uh, and again, I don't know exactly how we should run it because uh, it's very new for all of us, I think. And But uh, the best thing we can get out of it is that we get more uh, knowledge out of it together. So the floor is open. And I close. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> As uh, I was first <laughs> that Eric presented, I, I just would like to thank uh, all organizers and uh, also Eric for so nice uh, overview of the presentations and uh, welcome to this <laughs> um, About this uh, lake size uh, question. Sorry? No, I'm a novice. 
<laughs> Eric Nukas, you are very welcome <laughs> to our family. And maybe about this lake size uh, discussion point, I, I, I would say that it could be um, maybe an issue to study further on, on larger database, because uh, if you compare only two lakes, then uh, um, this um, conclusion is, is uh, maybe not uh, very uh, firmly standing, but but it, it could be studied uh, if if there are uh, sediment uh, data available and sediment cores. So thank you, and I'm really uh, amazed how how well this uh, virtual uh, format uh, can work. <laughs> Very, it's of course based on very few lakes, uh, what you have this idea, but maybe it's true because uh, small lakes, uh, this more easily get uh, stratified, for instance, uh, if, if the temperature changes than the big one do. So because it's a uh, physical affected by uh, wind and so on, the big ones. So there can be a lot of factors, not only this, but also maybe macrophiles and others can be much more sensitive to these changes that are in the small lakes because you, the physical condition change more dramatically in the short, uh, small lakes than it do in the big lake. So maybe that's the case. It's, it's worth discussing maybe because it's also yeah. where we... It, it could be, but uh, maybe to, to uh, be sure we should uh, study also uh, uh, big lakes which are stratified and, and small lakes which are not stratified. In this case, they, uh, this could be the main issue, I think, the stratification yep. issue. But if you talk about shallow lakes, when they're big, they're not uh, often stratified, you can say this. Uh, so, so when we di discuss shallow lakes, maybe it is. Yeah, least. yeah, yeah, that's, that can be, yes. But um, other opinions? It should not be a discussion between Tina and me. Yeah, <clears throat> I raise my hand, Eric. I don't know if you, we are so many. Yeah. It might be Just difficult. Talk, to find. It, yeah. uh, thank you for the, thank you, Eric, for for the summary. It was great. And thank you. congratulations, Tina, on your on your award and recognition. Very well deserved. And. I'm thinking about this this finding of yours about the large lakes being more less sensitive than the small ones. Um, when I saw it, I found it like it, it makes sense. Not not just because of the of the thermal behavior, so that shallow lakes are more sensitive to stratification, but there might be also that large lakes they have more habitats and therefore they 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 have more refugia or climate refugia for different communities. And therefore they can have, you know, it's like places where um, some organisms can withstand or cope with the effects of warming and therefore have more resilient internal mechanisms. So a small lake is more, tend to be more homogeneous. And therefore, if there's an effect of warming then it, it loses the capacity to resist because some communities are wiped out. It could be they have a fish kill or a macrophyte kill if the water level changes very dramatically. And large lakes can have these different habitats and work as internal inocula for the rest of the lake. So I would say that the, not only stratification pattern, can be different and sensitivity to stratification, but also a large lake would potentially have more of these internal mechanisms to resist. Uh, have you seen any of that or, or would you, or what are your thoughts about that potential of the large well, lake? I, I fully agree with this uh, point too. So thank you for this point, Mariana, maybe some other topics should be also discussed.
Yeah, but I think we, people should just uh, jump in. Uh, I cannot follow because I only see part of the screen. So who is going next? Uh, I just, I, if you okay. raised your hand, then just uh, break in and say something, and then we just uh, take it from there. I just raised my hand, and I was. It was more a general question about um, what you said about differing between seasonality, and this, I guess, it links with long and short term experiments. And because there are a lot of mesocosm experiments here, I had in my head that in mesocosm experiments, controls will help us to get rid of seasonality. So I wanted to know your opinion about that. So, like to me, if you have a control all the effects that you seek and it's more related to the treatments. But then, uh, yeah, I agree that there are a lot of variability, especially when you look at community composition. So I was just trying to, yeah, bring this to the discussion. What do you think about controls? And especially if you have long, longer experiments, like how do you think this seasonality aspect that you wrote uh, can be dealt with? Other people should answer, it's not me, I'm not a... Yeah, yeah, it was a general everyone, for everyone people is... running mesocodons. <laughs> I think you should analyze the seasonality effect. Uh, it's, it's very important in long-term experiments that you, uh, if you are, if you're doing it in different seasons that you take into consideration the seasonality effect and then uh, uh, your other treatments as part of the analysis. Because you can see some effect in summer, uh, uh, cyanobacteria bloom, for example, and it will be only because it's summer, because it's high temperature effect. Uh, but uh, also uh, you would see it in your warming experiment. So uh, you have to unravel which one of those is uh, giving you the, it's the, the the actual factor that it's at fault. Should we then be more careful about initial conditions? Or, you know, like instead of, because we have the long-term data or like long-term studies to like check for seasonality or, I don't know, yeah, I guess we can move on. Thank you for it, yeah, I guess. But like to me, it doesn't really have much sense to plot it by seasons in a mesocosmic experiment. If if you you're like if you your assumption that control us that all treatments at the beginning are at the same point you know um yeah, but that's that's the strength with the uh, short-term experiments that they start out with what we saw also in uh, in this experiment in uruguay that they start out with the con same conditions and then they run it and then you get the uh, also because there are so many replicates, get there very nice results. And if you then go up in scale, then have a one year study, then you run into uh, that all tanks are not going in the same direction. And if you run like ours since 2003, they are really di diverse. And this means that, the, that the, the replicates are not real replicates anymore. So th this is uh, the bad side of this, but the good thing is then, then you have many years of data, you can start to look at uh, some changes over time that are more, probably more realistic for the future because uh, short-term experiment give, given a short-term answer, I think. It's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, the, the, the long-term perspective you can see there. For instance, also this with, when we saw in the experiment, we'll hear more tomorrow, I think about the, the greenhouse gases. It's not so simple, I think, it's a, that the short-term experiment give the right answer about the carbon dioxide. It gives an, a nice results, but it's one out of several, I think. And so that's also telling me that we should work on many different, uh, uh, you can say, approaches, scales to, to come up with a conclusion. We cannot conclude from uh, one type of experiment. So or from a one a time series or something like that. So this is, the best thing is try to combine things, but everyone cannot combine everything. So it's, it doesn't, it's, it's not say, they're not saying then that you cannot do short term experiment. Of course you can, because it gives you some ideas. About it. And then you can build it up gradually as a community. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here, no? To combine yeah. the different things. I also have a question and linking the Uruguayan uh, experiment with um, 
maybe with some of, of uh, Tina's work because I, I, I was already intrigued. I had kind of a, a sneak preview of the CO2 emissions from the different treatments and uh, uh, that you uh, presented. And I, I'm intrigued by the fact that this, this, this big cyanobacterial bloom, uh, or at least the dominance, is, is taking up less CO2 than the other, um, the other treatments. And I was wondering, it, could that be because they are maybe shifting to bicarbonate use, or is there more recycling of CO2 in these systems, or what do you think could be um, an, an explanation for this? Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the question. Well, when we started the experiment, we started with uh, 123 algae, and and then in the the temperature intermediate, the greens dom we have a great dominance. We have a lot of papers that make the greens. We have. Um, uh, a big range of the growth in, in, in high temperature. Well, but when we arrived at the, the harvest the treatment, only the dominance of cyanobacteria, probably because we, they are a, a high affinity of the phosphorus and then the color, the uh, okay. greens algae don't, um, achieve competitive, something of this. And the CO2, all, all the mesocosmos were, um, we have a, a biggest influx of CO2, but just in the, the, the minor CO2, we found the 23 degrees. Then we believe that the warming can promote the, the biggest flux of the CO2. And, and then we, we, we think in this, we have a, another uh, authors here to, to that we <laughs> develop this, conduct this experiment. Then um, in this experiment, the CO2 don't, we, of course, we have a, a pelagic response of the, and a, a single response of phytoplankton. We don't consider the sediment and, and other factors of watershed and maybe influence the, influence the CO2. If I, I jump in also. Thanks, Arian, for, for the question. It, it is, uh, in a way, intriguing, yeah, that, uh, that the cyanobacteria didn't use more of the CO2. At the same time, metabolically, respiration gets more enhanced than photosynthesis with warming. So we might be also seeing this, um, a promotion of respiration under the warmest um, treatments, which were the ones dominated by cyanobacteria. Um, we didn't go deeper into the bicarbonate, so we could still do uh, with the analysis of the alkalinity and see what happened there. But uh, so far, we're more inclined to think this the, the higher enhancement of respiration with, with temperature so than of of the, synthesis. Yeah, so more recycling of the of the dead uh, yeah. algae, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Do, do you have any any other thoughts? Please, you're welcome. Um, I come in here if uh, that's okay. Um, so yeah, just to sort of answer the sort of general question about short-term experiments versus longer-term responses and. The lengths of experiments. I think um, I think what Eric said about trying to get consensus from you know a real range of different studies, long-term, short-term experiments, long-term late monitoring, and um, and even large the large spatial scale stuff that we saw from Kendra. I think that's what 
in a way um, really helps us to look across those different studies and and see if there's any consensus. And, and often we see for temperature and cyanobacteria, there is a lot of consensus. Um, but also to look at, see where there are um, outliers or un unusual effects, uh, let's say, for in some contexts. And, and we see that with some of the work with cyanobacteria and temperature that um, in very high temperatures and very high nutrient levels, we've, we've seen in the Mesocosm experiment in the UK, you actually, see a shift in cyanobacteria to greens and 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 so i think that context of each individual lake is really important where it sits on those two gradients for example uh, will greatly affect how that um, system responds to either of those two and, and and their interaction so i think it you know it isn't there's always going to be a landscape of responses um to either individual stresses or mul multiple stresses interacting and, and so it's to get the we need to get that good general picture but we need to understand where that relationship will change and even go the opposite direction because of where that our, our legs may individually sit so um personally i think the the best context for our studies is you know having lots of studies from long-term lake monitoring programs because then and, and gathering that globally or, or um nationally so we can actually see how real lakes respond over a long time and, and I, I think actually that both experiments and long-term data sets tend to give us probably more real effects than say the space, large spatial scale studies where you don't put time in because then you often start to see sort of geographic patterns and, and things like that that are, are very difficult to interpret to a, a, an effect really on, on say temperature um, so, so I, I think there is great merit in, in doing all these approaches and building up this picture of where lakes in individual landscapes and individual gradients, how they may respond generally to temperature and uh, nutrients, but there will be shifts in that landscape. That's my comment. I think the greenhouse gas response will be the same as the plankton response. You'll see, you know, you will see general effects and particularly with warming and nutrients you'll get increased greenhouse gases but but maybe there are these ecological surprises that we haven't you know that if we spot them we need to invest more why do we get that change in greenhouse gas emissions in, in this context hello everyone i have a comment in this topic about the the difference between short-term and long-term experiments uh, I saw the Giovanni Moresco's video, the, that's amazing. And I have a comment comparing the two kinds of experiments because in the field, the cyanobacteria can also interact with the environment to increase warming, like Giovanni Moresco said in his video. So besides the vicious loop between cyanobacterial blooms and warming related to CO2 emissions, large cyanobacterial filaments and columns can also absorb more energy through temperature and also through light and consequently warm faster the surface of the shallow lakes. In this case, this warming can increase stratification and consequently reduce the growth of the other phytoplankton groups through shading because large cyanobacteria can shade the the water column and consequently reduce the green algae and diatoms, for example, in the worst warming scenario, like in the Giovanni Moresco's video said that at 23 degrees, some bacteria grew faster than green algae and green algae grew faster in the intermediate degree of temperature. If nobody wants to go further on that, I want to ask another question to open the floor to other uh, subjects. I put a question in the chat. I don't know if you saw it to Carolina. Um, I'm interested in your work about Perifyton and more specifically how you measure the chlorophyll because I measure chlorophyll in the water, but then you know that it is related to the biomass of your phytoplankton, but how do you do it for Perifyton actually? 
Hi there. You used the same method, but you expressed uh, by micrograms per centimeter square or area. Uh, in case of, in my case, you can also uh, use dry weight and uh, express it uh, into uh, weight as well. So it's actually the same method. I gave I. You have my email, and we can discuss this further. Okay. You need Thank to. You. You need to uh, do a correction by file settings because you have a lot of dead material in there. Otherwise, you get uh, really high chlorophyll A, but uh, misreading the actual uh, amount of uh, algae that are alive in the very fighting. Yeah, and so you, you do extract them from the experiment and then analyze them afterwards. You cannot do it in the, in the aquarium itself or in the tank. No, no, okay. no. Okay, because I'm trying that as well also, so it would be nice to discuss. I also have another question related to that. Um, you found that your quality of the pyrophyton is, is reduced because of the warming and also new addition. And actually, I'm also uh, looking into that a bit, uh, considering uh, increasing CO2 levels. And they actually, they have found that uh, in phytoplankton, the quality of the tissue is reduced because of higher CO2 levels in the water. They're also expected for the future. Uh, and actually it changes the C, P and N ratio because it increases the carbon fixation. And then it shows that, it's, that the algae or the tissue is of lesser quality for zooplankton. So how do you think that these changes in quality will impact the zooplankton uh, community? So, uh, sorry, I got it in, in different uh, oh, uh, and sorry. very bad connection, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm calling for no, it, was, it was in my uh, part. Okay, okay. Now, uh, basically, I'm asking how do you think that the so the cons consumers of pyrophyton will be impacted by this reduced nutritional quality? Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, this goes up the ladder, but uh, actually, there's, uh, I discussed some uh, new findings. Uh, I, uh, there was a paper in Global Warming, I think, and very nice paper. And they found, uh, although they see these uh, changes in primary producers, that they are very low quality because they are feeding on low quality algae, uh, then uh, they don't see the same effect in the other trophic levels. But it's uh, biomass effect that they are accounting for. They have more uh, secondary producers and, and uh, uh, secondary consumers and uh, fish in, uh, in the uh, eutrophic systems. So uh, they, don't see, they accumulate these uh, fatty acids. So they don't see the effect in the other trophic levels. So these are very new studies and uh, so what I've seen so far, uh, even uh, with, uh, with uh, a study I performed here in Argentina, that you uh, see the immediate effect in the consumer, in the primary consumer. So uh, if you're feeding them uh, lower quality algae in terms of fatty acid, you get uh, lower quality uh, primary consumer. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. I also read something that they could change their diet from if you give them one sort of phytoplankton or algae and then you give them um, uh, a series of different species that they can actually change their diet and then eat from different sources to get their sufficient uh, P and N and C. This is part of the story and also they go for diatoms for instance if they are okay. there uh, yeah. because they have high quality nutri nutritional uh, uh, alga in, in terms of everything, CP, CN, um, fatty acids, and whatever you can think, think of. So um, if they can, and uh, that's the, it depends also on, on what macroinvertebrate macro or primary consumer you're discussing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, I also think for uh, soil plankton, we should not uh, only look at the algae composition of CN and P because many of the zooplankton and shallow lakes, when we are dealing with those at least, they can also take a little bit near the sediment. And uh, they have learned from grand, 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 grandmother 
that uh, sediment is rich in P. So if you're missing P, you can uh, just go down and not a P, but uh, take some P. And this is yeah. a, there's disturbance of the sediment. And then there, are some, there was a nice uh, study by Macaulo, I think, a, a long time ago. He showed that they could uh, smell phosphorus. So they could smell areas where there were higher concentration of phosphorus and they went for there. So because uh, so so we should we can get something uh, we can say food limitation a lot in in a, in, a, in a glass bottle. But maybe it's much less out there in the field because they have learned it also. They are not, uh, and they can see that I always use this example. If a soil plankton can go 60 meters every day to avoid being eaten by fish, a small soil plankton go 60 meters down and up again, then it's because they have learned a lot and they are taking consequences of the conditions they are living under. And this is the same with food, I think, that they, we have to take that into account that they are not stupid. So there's, we, of course, it's to put it at the edge, but uh, this is we put have to put it into perspective. Many other things. I was thinking to bring up the in this session. There are a lot of studies regarding nitrogen loading and cyanobacteria. Uh, and there are like a few questions. Also, you brought it up in your presentation, Eric, about the chicken egg, egg problem in, in TN. But yeah, yeah how, how do we explain this? There is, I think Jan said like, if cyanobacteria is supposed to be able to, ni uh, to fix nitrogen, uh, is it logical to see that they are better uh, or grow faster when we increase nitrogen compared to other taxa or yeah, I would be curious to know, especially from those who, who has been focused on increasing nitrogen loading. And yeah, what is your yeah discussion about this but consistent I results, I would say. Egg, the chicken egg, I can answer. Then I can answer some of the other things. The chicken egg is, uh, is uh, appearing because when you're in shallow lakes, nitrate goes to zero in summertime, in most lakes. Uh, of course, not very oligotrophic one, but where you have the blue-green algae and, and green algae, then it goes to zero. And this means that uh, if uh, we have a very good relationship between cyanobacteria and nitrogen, then you can say, is it because uh, nitrogen is high or is it because phytoplankton is high? Because uh, they go to zero means that uh, it, the rest of the nitrate disappear by denitrification. But what the plants, the algae need, they get. And therefore, this chicken egg exists in these systems. It's different from phosphorus because in summertime, you have release of phosphorus from the sediment. So therefore, they are not so well related to phosphorus in the summertime in hypertrophic or eutrophic lakes, but nitrogen because total N is algae more or less uh, in these systems. But therefore, experiments are important because you cannot get it out from the time series. It's impossible. And experiments, that's why also this experiment with one year without nitrogen and adding it. So maybe uh, uh, Mario can talk a little bit more about that from her experiment where they suddenly add nitrogen to the system again. So then it's an experimental uh, addition. The other thing is where you have the chicken egg, you cannot get around it on time series. I think. Hello, uh, I can <clears throat> comment on my experiment. Um, uh, it was also surprising uh, when I first saw the end fixers that they increase so rapidly in our system. But uh, when you think about it uh, uh, a bit more, then it's uh, it's quite logical. Sorry, I have a very sore throat today. Um, uh, the thing is that if uh, if you add nitrate to the system and you have very high levels of nitrate <clears throat> in the tanks, then of course the nitrogen fixers also prefer the nitrogen that is easily usable. And so if you have the phytoplankton dominated tanks that were in nitrogen starvation for a year, so in these tanks there was a lot of aphanism menon beforehand when we started the experiment. So here um, um, if you start adding the nitrogen again then they already have upper hand because there are much more of them because they they were there before, and there were more of them. Uh, 
Oh, I have a comment you, on sorry. this. Oh, sorry. You can continue. I wanted to say thank you for the question, <laughs> for the answer. Sorry, so you go. So I have a, a comment being related to this chicken and egg products because some studies <laughs> has increased the, the knowledge about the effects of nutrients on cyanobacterial blooms, but most of them use total nutrients as a proxy to relate phytoplankton growth with, with resources. However, some papers have shown that the most part of total nutrients are attached to the algal cells. So some papers relating the dissolved inorganic nutrients can improve the understanding of how nutrients can increase the growth of cyanobacterial blooms. But of course, there is no doubt that nutrients increase cyanobacteria. But some, some models that use total phosphorus or total nitrogen can fall into these chicken and egg products because cyanobacterial blooms can also release nutrients and part of these nutrients are attached to the algal cells and are not absorbed by the algal growth. I, I was trying to figure out also based on this, if these mesocosms, sorry, I, I don't remember, Marjo, maybe you can, uh, or are you, did you present total nitrogen or when you do this, you also check other fractions like, yeah, the inorganic, con so like that you divide or differentiate between these fractions. Oh. So I understand the chicanet problem and for maybe long-term studies or when you have, you only have TN. Um, but for these mesocosm experiments, do you try to like disentangle all the nitrogen fractions that could help to explain this? No, not, not really. Okay, thank you. You have nitrate, uh, ammonia, so you have information, that, but yeah. not uh, very detailed. Yeah. You have not dissolved uh, organic nitrogen. That's not included. And this um, picture where I think my my Marju Mayu I don't know sorry how to pronounce your name but, <laughs> um, uh, where you get an increase in um, nitrogen fixers uh, and I think you were right. It's the context of your mesocosms where mm -hmm. you had um, you know nitrogen limitation for quite a period and they were present there um, and, and so I think. Generally, I, I, I've got an unpublished study, but um, I've been looking at a, a lot of lakes across Europe of, um, of bioavailable nitrogen phosphorus over the summer period alone. And um, there you see a real increase in cyanobacteria biovolume um, in two contexts. One where phosphorus is in excess, so where nitrogen is limiting, and uh, the other where nitrogen and phosphorus are in excess. Uh, so where neither are limiting, you don't actually um, see increases in cyanobacteria biomass in either the co-limiting or the where nitrogen, say, is in excess. So I, I think it, it sort of highlights more that probably an excess of, phos of phosphorus is needed for cyanobacteria to really dominate. Um, and uh, um, But there will be contexts where nitrogen fixers can overcome that because nitrogen fixation is such a high energy intensive process, uh, it often requires good light conditions and some other conditions to be suitable. And, and so that's why we don't see it as a general rule of thumb. In fact, we don't see it that often, but I think with, with particular context, you will see it. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. We have 27 minutes left, I think. If I understand it correct, then the question is, what do you want to discuss now? Can I introduce a new topic about multiple stressors? Yeah, we can take that up. Yes. I saw the Eric Epson video and I, this is very interesting and also related to the comparisons of biogeographical effects of climates on cyanobacteria or phytoplankton. And in these new data sets from Danish lakes, from many Danish lakes, the, the group showed that the effects are not biogeo biogeographically based. So the effects can be related to climate change. 
independent of the biogeographical region. And in your, in your study, you showed that the synergistic effects of eutrophication and warming can increase the biomass of cyanobacteria independent of the region and also can reduce the, the biomass and the size of cladocerans, copepods, the ratio between Daphnian and cladocerans. However, these effects was thought to be related to warming, that the most causal effects between the regressions. But my question is, could the, considering that warming and eutrophication also increase the cyanobacterial growth in a season dependent manner, could cyanobacteria synergistically interact with temperature to significantly reduce size of cladocerans, daphne and copepods? Yes, I, said, uh, it's, I think that the studies where you have no fish, then Daphnia become big enough to control everything. They're a good example from Uruguay where they're fish killed, and then everything cleared up, it cleared up in warm conditions. So this means that fish is the, you can say, the key factor. Yes. But underneath that, there is, of course, other factors. This means that if the fish have brought the size of zooplankton down to a relatively small level of scale, then they cannot control the phytoplankton. And then it becomes an interference from cyanobacteria on the zooplankton. But if you can get the fish away completely, it will clear up. And, and you see it in the systems where they, they disappeared. So it's a, and it's a, it has been argued that because uh, large zooplankton cannot tolerate high temperatures because of, for metabolism reasons. And that's true also, this is one factor. But an overriding factor are the fish because else, why do they become dominating in Uruguay and lakes when fish are dying? And there are hardly any Daphnia there before. There are some in the sediment. You can, if they look in the several of the sediment, of course they have taken surface sediment, they found Daphnia resting eggs, but they were not in the water. But when the fish kill came, they were there. So it's, it's, it's the key factor, but on t underneath that, uh, all the other factors. This means then you start have interference if they become smaller than the biggest step here. And, and therefore you see this uh, interaction effect. And this is the temperature effect also, you can say, if temperature goes up, you get more blue-green algae, then it's more difficult for the zooplankton to control them. And especially if they're small. So it's, it's there's not, uh, not one say, conclusion, but uh, there are exist different scenarios depending on the overall conditions, the framework set, who set the scene. This, this is the thing we have to think about. And this yes, I got it. Nicely with this uh, change in size, and Mariana has a nice paper on this. We're showing this or, or for looking at data from many different places in the world. So it's very clear that you have some general pattern and then you get smaller fish size means higher predation and so forth. This is also clear. And even in the Danish lakes, we now see that warm years, or it's, it's not in warm years, but over time, they get smaller and smaller fish, not because they are more anglers, but simply because the temperature is going up. Yes, I ask this question because here in tropical ecosystems, especially in the semi arid region, the zooplankton is kind of adapted to the cyanobacterial bloom conditions. There are many papers of the group of Rio Grande do Norte University relating the, the, the increase of cyanobacteria through the zooplankton biomass. And in the, the previous paper that I published and that I mentioned here in the comments, we also demonstrated that the cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria can select small forms of zooplankton like rutiferous, Cyclopod copepods and the, the smaller ones, and they become adapted to cyanobacterial bloom. So, in this in this paper, we showed that cyanobacteria can also influence the the alteration, the structure, and the reduction of large cladocerans, large copepods, and especially the herbivorous copepods and herbivorous cladocerans. So, here in the warmer climates, the there are many multiple stressors interacting to cyanobacterial blooms, to zooplankton, to phytoplankton, to change its structure and abundance. Yeah, but I agree with that, that these things are changing, but you cannot, you cannot get the big Daphnia there. To, so you cannot control them. You can uh, harvest 
but you cannot control the cyanobacteria. That's, that's the problem you have if you have fish uh, predation on the systems. And I know from one of your papers, it's very nice papers, but uh, you say that you can add zooplankton. And this is, uh, I don't believe in that, I have to say. The other things are fine, what you've written, but it is not, uh, I don't believe in that because the fish will just say, thank you. That's what we all, <laughs> thank you for giving us. Yes. Uh, and some have tried it. They have, in China, there is a big, it was a big industry that they produced Daphne and then put them out and uh, nothing happened. Only some say, thank you. And this yes, is the, and, the and here we don't have. Yeah, so it's sorry. Yeah. Here we also don't have large cladosterons in high abundance in the natural ecosystems. Yeah. May, may I ask a question? Of course. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to know. Hi, Eric. Hi, Mariana. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to know if, uh, uh, do you have any idea about what do you mean by small size fish and large size fish? <clears throat> any size range? Um, yes, normally th there are, uh, there's a limit, uh, let's say of 10 centimeters to be called small fish. Okay. But, uh, that's uh, that's very often you see that in the literature, but but uh, it's relative to the community that you have in every place, of course, and the species that are more frequent in a particular area, and then you can that limit. Uh, and what? Right, but uh, yeah. that ten centimeters is common, but uh, here in the subtropics in Uruguay we found the mean size of fish with in in the littoral areas is three centimeters. So we're talking about very tiny fish and those can be adults. So mm -hmm. that's the size of a juvenile fish in a temperate lake at the very beginning. So soon they will be lower than that. So it depends on the, the fish that you have. And what about the constant reproduction in these fish? Because uh, in some places the fish reproduction is restricted to seasons. So the predation pressure may be higher, right? Yeah, if, if, I, if I may answer that. Uh, that also, um, we've seen uh, increases in the, in the reproductive season with warming. So that mm -hmm. was found in many uh, comparisons al along latitudes. And also, well, also with experiments that the reproductive season either increases or the same species can have more reproductive events when the climate gets warmer. So that's, uh, that was also described in some papers, one by Gorgenola and collaborators. They found the same species along uh, their distribution range and, and there are more there is an increase in reproductive events towards the tropics than in, in higher zones. So that's also mm -hmm. something that it's uh, seen quite clearly. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, in going back to the previous comments about the cyanobacteria and the uh, feedbacks, it seems very clear that the window of opportunity to control cyanobacteria gets smaller with warming by different processes. So that seems very clear to me. It's either physical, chemical, or biological, direct or indirect effects of warming, but uh, there's really a small window of opportunity. And once that window is closed, then it seems extremely difficult to get rid of them, at least in tropical and subtropical areas. And that's uh, because of fish and, and of course, because of the zooplankton and the stratification patterns, the chemical changes induced by the cyanobacteria bloom as well. So all the pieces put to the same, the same image as I see. I find it hard to believe that there can still be discussion about it. But, uh, to reduce the loading even further in warm lakes. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, but more so in the future. 
but uh, we going back to and um, um, summarizing or, or uh, to this uh, what we see in uh, in uh, in the mesocosms is that the warmest climate scenario is not uh, the the cyanobacteria are not flourishing uh, eric we have discussed this we have the paper on, on filamentous green algae and so this is also the short term like, like like looks like a, for me looks like more like a heat wave like what would you the the this cyanobacteria bloom that you would see in a short uh, in in, in a short period of time uh, because you have a high temperature increase and then you have the mesocosms and what about the real the the, the lakes uh, what do you see about filamentous algae and the composition of phytoplankton there because uh, what you have in lemming it's uh, very nice uh, algae actually over there it's cryptomonads and and diatoms and some chlorophytes. Yeah, in, in the case of uh, lemming, you see these filamentous algae, and that's also why might you saw a low concentration of phytoplankton in the highest temperature tanks. And this is relatively consistent now. And this is probably because of the, uh, the uh, filamentous algae. And Carolina did an ex experiment back in time in 2014, I think, uh, looking at the effect on, uh, on these filamentous on the phytoplankton. And that was an inhib inhibitory effect. As, as you can take a, talk a little bit more about that, maybe. And, and there are these systems are found in warm lakes. And here in Turkey, where I've been working, you can see them sometimes that filamentous algae dominate, and they're clear. So they, you have these systems. But I don't think they're so common as uh, our tanks are a little bit different, uh, I think. So it's a. Uh, it, but but also it, talking about discussing the regional effect, because this, Mariano was discussing this tropical and subtropical and the stratification and the effect of small fish. And then maybe in temperate lakes or in other uh, areas, you could have a. Uh, filamentous algae thriving a little bit more or for periods and then uh, you have this clear water uh, effect and then high quality algae, algae dominate uh, actually but in, in, in really low biomass so I, I was wondering because we have been talking a lot about phytoplankton and then you kind of bring up zooplankton a bit and then move to fish. And I was uh, wondering about, because in this session, I think Dilwin and you, you, you Inc. presented zooplankton uh, data. Um, and I was also like now thinking about, you, Ewing, did you have fish in your tank? So, because I was thinking now, would it for zooplankton that are there in the, they are intermediate uh, guys in the, in the food web and also maybe more trick, trickier to get a specific how they evolve or how they are affected. And I was wondering for these specific mesocosm experiments that helps us to understand uh, new things, uh, would it be also crucial to add or take into account fish apart from the seasonality, like to, to make sure that like the variability is because I'm not sure, but the means and extremes effect of climate warming scenarios on planktonic communities, I am still not sure which is the conclusion about zooplankton community versus um, temperature, and also with the high variability that we found in Turkey with Dilwin a study. So I would be curious if to know if everybody that studies zooplankton adds fish, and if this should be really. Uh, consistent or if we should really take this into account to better interpret fish uh, zooplankton data. Hello, yeah, time for your question. Yes, in my study, I, do you hear me? Do you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, yes. In my study, I thought we found that significant difference compared to the control already after the first wave and uh, insignificant, we have a decline of rotifer biomass. And that's, uh, that uh, show the main, the main effects of the heat wave on the plankton that I fall from my experiment. Uh, and sorry, did you have fish in your tongues? No, I don't have any fish. Uh, in okay, my, okay. No. okay, thank you. 
Yeah. But what we, we have talked a little bit about this heat wave effect, uh, and Huang, maybe you can say a little bit about that. What What is your uh, interpretation of your results? Uh, do you expect long-term effects, or is it a short-term phenomena? So the system recover again after a short time, or what is your opinion based on your experiments? Because you run it also for some some uh, weeks after the everything was uh, settled down, and uh, can you tell a little bit about that? Uh, how what is, how resilient was the system? You had short term effects very clearly in in the in between the two heat waves, but uh, generally it was not so st strong later on. There was, but yeah, maybe... from my, yes, yes, uh, from my first uh, my first project, I just like uh, want to know the short term effects on the plankton community and how they recover after the one the one month we don't have any effect of the heat wave. And maybe in the next time we will like continue with the long term, longer time. Mm. Yeah. But any other opinion about this with short term and long term effect of heat waves? I realized in your experiment, it was a nice, uh, really nice data. And, uh, but I also realized that the controls for chlorophyll A after the second, uh, like, no, the first heat wave, yeah, they also increased. So yeah, it, it's really amazing, this mesocosms like, yes. and it's really hard for me, like, to really understand what's going on there. Uh, but uh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Any other opinion about heat waves? Is this a short-term phenomenon, a long-term phenomenon? Mm. Actually, I, I did not fall. Yeah, I did not fall in my opinion with the short term or long term because I just start with my experiment just six months. And mm -hmm. I just like I am a new in this field because I just a master student and this is my short term for my thesis. So uh, yeah. I want to learn from you guys. Yeah, it was not an attack on you. It was a question if other people have experience with short-term and long-term effect of heat waves. My general feeling is that it's a, it's a short-term phenomenon unless you have fish kills or you have a macrophyte disappearing or something like that. Some of the bigger things has to react Yes, yeah. I think it's a short term that the, the 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 recovery is relatively fast, and we did the one experiment in Denmark also, where several here have been involved, and it was uh, the the response time was very short, I think, over uh, these experiment in this experiment, and I also think it's the same in Huang's uh, what she presented uh, that uh, it was not a long term effect. Uh, you can discuss uh, this uh, difference at the end of your experiment, but it could also be for other reasons. It's not a, very easy to explain why why the one that was uh, at the uh, intermediate temperature was a little bit high in the end. It it's, it's, it's can be difficult to explain, but but uh, and that's, that's probably because uh, the system is adapted to very big uh, temperature change from year to year. And so. So it, uh, if, it's, if it's not a long lasting one that change things like fish kill because of oxygen depletion, long time stratifications, things that uh, then it's uh, in my opinion, but I may be wrong. It's just a gut feeling that it will, uh, they are adaptive to this kind of things. But of course they can have a strong effect when it happens. Uh, also low pressure can uh, release a lot of gases from this. And then you get a lot of gas release from the sediment and so on. So it's a short term phenomena can be strong, but uh, it's for the system, the recovery capacity is not so poor because they're used to it. Perhaps it's comparable to ice cover, right? I mean, the ice cover also only affects very big. If it's a long ice cover and there's fish kill and it, and it kills the macrophytes, if there's snow on it, yeah. then you see longer term effects. Otherwise, it's also uh, very short term, I would say. So I guess here we could bring up like the tipping point or threshold for the systems to change, but I guess this 
threshold also depends on the type of system. So it could be a weaker or a stronger threshold for depending on which system you are talking about, um, I guess. And then I would think that uh, the effect of a heat wave or any other short term perturbation is different regarding it, it depending on the resilience of the particular layer. So it may be the same perturbation you apply and the system can respond in a, in a very long lasting way if it's already weakened. So the, if the other self repairing mechanisms are weakened and then the, the reaction can be long lasting of the system. If it's near, if it's already weak, let's say, if it's less resilient. And if you have a stronger system, then it might recover very quickly to the original situation. So probably uh, the response can be system dependent or contingent to the, the rest of the community function in, in that particular lake or pond. But uh, I, I think it's a very interesting avenue for research because we have already lots of uh, of uh, investigations with an increase in warming, a constant increase in warming, and then comparatively, we still have few experiments with short-term perturbations, either heat waves or dilution or salt increase, simulating catchment increases uh, after a heavy precipitation event and so on. So I think we, we need more of these investigations to before we can get a, a clearer picture together with the other approaches. So in that way, I, I, I add to the words of Eric and of Lawrence that we need different approaches and see what's the coherence of the results. So if the results of long-term monitoring are similar to paleo and are similar to experiments, then we may be seeing a, a clear signal of what to expect after constant warming or after heat events and so on. But uh, in isolation, I still we are far from reaching a conclusion with this particular part of climate change, like extreme events. Yeah, maybe just a short note to add on, like on what has been already said. Uh, I think one really crucial aspect of these extreme events is, is really the characteristics, like uh, on one hand, the temporal aspect, but then also magnitude wise uh, on how these extreme events are occurring and, and therefore also pushing communities or individual organisms out of their thermal tolerance zone. So um, I think, uh, that's quite a tricky question actually to answer. Uh, um, like saying in general, like, okay, heat waves might not have long term effects or have only short term effects or whatever. I think it's, uh, it's a bit more complex to see based on, on, on really how we characterize these heat waves. And until today, I mean, there's not really a common definition on, on on what this extreme event really is, which makes it even more complicated. And uh, yeah, therefore I'm, I'm, I was also quite uh, curious and uh, uh, thanks again, Juan, for sharing your, your results, uh, which is also quite facing in my own, own research work. So uh, yeah, looking forward to see more, thanks. We have two minutes left. Who would like to take them? One minute for a question, one and for an answer. Can we ask for the salinity guy, the Igor, <laughs> poor thing? Yeah. Yeah, Nobody. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess he's here. I can not see him. But uh, because you took uh, data from uh, different years, but I, I'm, I didn't see it clear how this lake varies on salinity because I think you ended up saying that it's a, cycl a cyclic pattern because each year you found different phytoplankton communities. 
So I would be curious to know exactly how the salinity pattern in this uh, freshwater lake is it like or like I I was I didn't get this, and I would be uh, it would be nice to figure out how yeah how salinity is driving the phytoplankton community based on on your different results of each year that you sample. Thank you. Or we can conclude <laughs> the set. No, it's okay. It's a difficult question. <laughs> that was <laughs> silence. I will figure it out. <laughs> we, we stop for today. We also have two more days on climate effects. And tomorrow is more gases. So you will have to discuss how much is coming out of one place to another place. And uh, don't eat onions tonight. So. I, I want to say something, just to acknowledge Coca for putting this uh, virtual meeting together and be able to give us this opportunity. And also, uh, we discussed something about uh, monitoring programs, and uh, that's uh, an important part of this of this story, uh, having data from actual lakes and putting all together this. Uh, short-term experiments, mesocosm experiments, and the uh, uh, actual uh, data coming from the lakes. And uh, then we have to figure out how to uh, sample or have data from uh, places that where monitoring programs are not in place. And, and then, uh, yeah, because there will be a, bi a, a big bias regarding what's done in Europe and uh, in the uh, US and uh, maybe in, in, in hotspots in other parts of the world compared to South America, Africa, whatever we can think of. That's my remark on that. Yeah. And with it, we call it a day. The Chinese has to sleep now. <laughs> it's late in the day. We continue tomorrow and Tom Davidson will take you through the one and a half hour and uh, on Wednesday Santa will take over. So, yeah. Thank you, you Eric. See you. Bye. 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 Thanks everyone. See you. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.